Well, I want to continue um, uh, some of the comments that uh, Terry had uh, made on, um, on family-based studies and really um, talk about the, um, the family-based studies as the, the um, preamble to, and where, where the ideas were that, that diseases were aggregating in, in families. Um, which then, of course, has led to the rationale for uh, perhaps uh, less hypothesis-oriented uh, uh, studies like the genome-wide association studies. So I want to um, just talk a little bit about study designs that generate uh, uh, or test uh, genomic hypotheses, kind of in a broad, more philosophical sense as we start talking about genetic associations. We are epidemiologists, after all, and we we can associate to almost anything. Uh, um, we we want to uh, describe the major study designs which involve genetically related individuals, and these are a couple more. I want to talk a bit more about uh, twin studies, and uh, then get into something called trios that I introduced with the the um, the Crohn's uh, study that I uh, started with, um, and give you some. Uh, um, literature examples, and then talk about the advantages and disadvantages of these designs uh, in disease gene uh, associations. But just to say is, is that uh, uh, for many diseases, the uh, associations in families obviously came from the bedside, um, and um, uh, William Osler um, talked about familial aggregation of coronary disease. Uh, William Osler is the uh, kind of father of internal medicine. Um, and certainly around the uh, turn of the century. Uh, and so um, uh, Hippocrates talked about uh, familial aggregation. Uh, so this is just something ob observed. And here's, a, here's an observation. Some of you know David Harrington. Um, uh, David is, um, uh, is um, Associate Dean for Research at uh, Wake Forest and um, uh, was a fellow uh, like uh, Terry um, with me. Um, uh, a number of years ago, and um, uh, he's now um, doing quite a bit of uh, genetic uh, epidemiology, and one wonders if this was where he got interested. Uh, and this is a, um, a set of my patients. This is actually, this paper is a series of uh, several twin pairs. Uh, and uh, these uh, two 51-year-olds um, uh, were um, uh, Hungarian uh, refugees. They crawled uh, uh, out from under the barbed wire in Hungary in 1956 together. Uh, they went to the same universities. Uh, they were electrical engineers at the same defense firm in Baltimore. Um, they smoked the uh, same uh, brand of uh, unusual Central European cigarettes. Their LDL cholesterol was the same to the milligram per deciliter. Their blood pressures and diabetes were normal. Uh, and um, um, EB here uh, showed up at Johns Hopkins Hospital with an inferior lateral myocardial infarction um, and a little bit of ventricular tachycardia and underwent cardiac catheterization uh, and was referred to me in our preventive cardiology clinic. Um, six months later, uh, AB, uh, his identical twin brother, uh, on a business trip to uh, Detroit, uh, came down with a episode of severe chest pain and an inferior lateral myocardial infarction and, and underwent uh, cardiac catheterization at the um, Henry Ford Hospital. Uh, and um, I had the uh, film sent to me. Uh, one of the striking things about the films is that we had to, um, we had to uh, put some extra tape on them because um, they were identical. In other words, um, if you mixed them up, you couldn't tell who was who. Um, those of you who aren't cardiologists might not know right versus left dominance coronaries, but the left dominance is uh, the minority of individuals. Both of them had a left dominance. Their right and left anterior descending um, uh, coronaries were normal, and they both had a single lesion, a 90% stenosis, at a, the same place of a, a obtuse marginal branch of the left circumflex coronary. So what is this? What is this an example of? Well, this is an example of publication bias, okay? <laughs> because obviously this is very interesting. It's an anecdotal case. It really doesn't um, prove anything other than the possibility of is, is if you have identical genes 
identical behaviors, um, uh, probably, uh, possibly genetically um, identical um, uh, uh, organ structures, um, that you will have, you could have identical uh, structural, physiological, and clinical disease. Uh, and this has been the basis, obviously, for uh, interest in families and interest in family studies. Uh, but I still think that the reason that uh, this was published was, uh, was somewhat of a, a bias of, um, of confirming what we already suspected. But it certainly was interesting um, and um, uh, uh, certainly got the idea that um, there, this uh, did have something to say about uh, the genetics of coronary artery disease. So we epidemiology, uh, epi epidemiologists have been obviously studying disease for a long time and uh, particularly um, alter, um, um, relating it to altered physiology like um, high blood pressure or gene products like um, LDL cholesterol, uh, et cetera. And um, what, what the whole uh, opportunity for gene association studies is, is to go upstream uh, to look uh, up to not only some of the, uh, the physiologic or, or, or protein products of genes, um, but actually the expression of those genes and the polymorphisms that lead to either structural differences or um, levels of product differences. Uh, and, and so uh, the point is, is that um, a lot of our gene association studies obviously uh, start with phenotype but then um, start to explore things along this, this pathway um, obviously uh, ending up with, uh, with gene uh, variants um, with the new, phys new methodologies that uh, Terry's talked about. Um, but the point is, is that it is a logic progression of our epidemiologic uh, activities. And, um, and so this is, uh, again, a, another reason why I think this, this course on, um, on um, population genomics obviously is, is uh, key to um, really the next uh, generation of, of epidemiology. So there's a variety of, uh, of questions then regarding the genetic etiology of the disease. Uh, covered here is does it aggregate in families? Is it inherited from parent to um, offspring? Uh, which chromosomes would carry the, um, the, 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 the disease gene? Which specifically genes are associated with the disease? What gene variants are associated with it um, amongst the genes? And what are the gene what gene products are altered um, as a cause of it. So a variety of, of questions to ask to answer the real question, uh, does this, is there a genetic etiology of the, the disease? What uh, we're going to talk about here are um, twin studies, linkage analysis, just some other comments on family-based um, designs. Um, but these have all led to um, identification, possibly, of, of candidate to genes, um, which, as Terry has already described, uh, have a relatively sobering track record in terms of being able to be reproducible, although there are certainly some, some major success stories. Uh, uh, and then these genes uh, were um, tested for disease versus no disease uh, and would rep replicate. What we have philosophically with the genome-wide association studies, these are given the, um, the um, adjective agnostic uh, because there really is no prior uh, hypothesis, no, no um, religious di uh, dictum of, uh, in which to uh, essentially say that A causes B, but rather the entire genome is tested for disease or no disease. Uh, and then uh, with the exhortations of experts like, uh, like Terry Manolio uh, have uh, required really replication so that we're not totally um, confused by a lot of, um, of alpha error. So, um, but just to, in terms of genome association studies on a philosophical basis, um, uh, we tell our students obviously that hypothesis-driven research uh, is, um, is the way to do things. You come up with your hypothesis and you test it, et cetera. And um, the genome-wide association studies with 
really a, a, a different philosophical approach, I think, it jarred us a bit. Um, and there's a variety of subtle and non-subtle implications of this, this, uh, this uh, agnostic approach um, that I think we're going to continue to talk about. But given their sway in terms of um, state of the art in, in the whole gene association area, uh, I think it's appropriate to just ponder uh, this really lack of saying that we know what's up here uh, and we're going to test a hypothesis. Um, this says we're going to look at a million polymorphisms and we're going to find out um, how it sorts out. And we're going to talk a lot more about that. Well, family history obviously is uh, is independent risk factor is uh, independent risk factor in in many diseases uh, and. Um, Obviously, uh, we teach our students in epidemiology the importance of uh, defining a positive family history. And obviously, uh, some of these are self-reported versus verified. Uh, it's important to specify divisional elements, the age of onset, uh, the degree of relatedness of the affected relatives, the number of relatives. Um, uh, our uh, departed colleague, Roger Williams, probably, I think, has done the most elegant work looking within coronary disease of, of uh, of, the, of relatives and onset of, of age, of uh, onset, et cetera, and with this relative to coronary disease. But um, it, um, it does describe the, uh, the definition of a positive family history is, is perhaps a little bit more subtle than, and, and complicated than sometimes we give it. We also have to remember family information bias. Uh, and all of us uh, clinicians have had a patient where say in the coronary care unit, dad comes in with this myocardial infarction uh, and um, the question is, uh, has any other relatives um, had this? And um, you have the uh, interrogation of the entire pedigree to the extent that any of us would have loved to do uh, in a field study, um, uh, whereas uh, someone without that disease um, uh, wouldn't have that. So there is this, uh, this family information bias, the flow of family information about exposures of illnesses stimulated or by or directed to a new case in the midst. Um, so there is a uh, perhaps the inflation of cases, um, or perhaps the deflation of cases uh, in um, in controls, um, uh, the deflation of relatives um, in controls uh, compared to uh, that of cases. Uh, Terry talked a little bit about the relative risk ratio. Um, again, a measure of the strength of familial aggregation, the prevalence of disease and relatively affected uh, persons over that of the general population. Uh, and uh, here is a list of the, um, uh, of the risk ratios uh, for a variety of diseases. And one of the recurrent uh, themes here is this. If you look at, uh, at these with um, pretty sizable risk ratios, look at autism here. Uh, these are the diseases now that are showing up as the focus of genome-wide association studies. And, and this has been the rationale for targeting uh, diseases, particularly uh, some of the uh, psychiatric diseases, for example, are these uh, large uh, ratios. And certainly is the preamble to doing some more sophisticated studies to find out the candidate to genes that uh, are causing this. Now, uh, siblings and, and first degree relatives, obviously, uh, if you have, um, um, uh, say, uh, two uh, alleles uh, each, um, what you have is, um, is about four chances uh, out of 16 that, um, that these two siblings will share that allele. Uh, you have four that they'll share not, neither of the alleles. Um, they'll be totally different. And then the other eight uh, will um, uh, uh, have that uh, they share one or the other of the alleles. And obviously, this is the Mendelian uh, inheritance pattern uh, that, um, that Terry was, uh, was talking about uh, and allows us, obviously, then in family studies to uh, make all so sorts of hypotheses. Uh, there have been a variety of studies in epidemiology, as you well know, of nature versus nurture. Um, mi migrant studies, for example, are another. Uh, group of studies which would be in this. Uh, and twin studies uh, obviously had their own place in the development uh, of, of genetic hypotheses. And if you look at the genome-wide association studies, there will be frequent uh, citations of, uh, 
of uh, comparisons of monozygous and dizygous twins as the rationale uh, for uh, such studies. So about 0.3% uh, of births are monozygous uh, twins, 0.2 uh, to 1% of births uh, are dizygous. Apparently this is quite um, heterogeneous uh, geographically with Africa having the highest rate of dizygous twins and, um, and North, Northern Europe uh, being below. Uh, studies of twins reared apart obviously test the, um, the nature versus nurture and uh, adopted twin studies um, have also been, um, been, um, been useful. Uh, there's also additional studies of siblings um, uh, and uh, we'll maybe comment on, on that a little bit later. So a variety of studies uh, in these groups and uh, there's been um, measures of, of familial aggregation um, in qualitative traits, the term concordance, and in quantitative traits, correlation, heritability. And I want to just say a couple of those comments before we get on to some of the study designs. The um, concordance is the number of twin pairs with disease um, among um, it's calculated the number of twin pairs um, with the disease amongst those uh, twin pairs with at least one affected twin. One would think of this should be a two by two uh, table, but um, um, obviously then everything would be um, almost 100% um, concordance in, a, in an infrequent disease. So you take the number of twins with both affected um, divided by the number of twins with both affected and one with only one affected. Uh, if it's less than 100% in monozygous twins, you suggest you have non-genetic factors, uh, and if monozygous is greater than dizygous, obviously it's, it's uh, evidence for genetic factors, and uh, the simplicity of this whole thing, I think, uh, adds to uh, its, um, its being um, uh, convincing. Uh, this is uh, kind of one of your classic studies where uh, monozygous twins and dizygous twins were looked at, and the number of concordant pairs really weren't that different. Um, but when it was then stratified by less than 50 or greater than 50, you had 100% uh, concordance in early onset um, uh, Parkinson's disease um, compared to um, uh, greater than 50-year uh, age monozygous Parkinson's disease. And, and obviously now we recognize uh, early onset Parkinson's disease has a distinct uh, disease entity and one in which um, uh, many of the genetic studies have uh, have focused. Uh, so um, just a, 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 a the use of concordance. And again, uh, this concordance uh, in monozygous versus dizygous, obviously you see these large difference in, uh, in things like uh, non-traumatic epilepsy, um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, uh, um, uh, inflammatory diseases, uh, structural diseases, uh, lupus. Um, again, um, if you go down the list of, among the first 109 genome-wide association studies, um, virtually all of these um, have been uh, targeted, and this has been the, the rationale for uh, the studying of those first as having a, um, a genetic origin. Uh, another um, um, opportunity is to look at qualitative traits, uh, and uh, Terry's going to talk um, uh, some more about qualitative traits as well, but obviously you have your nice um, bell-shaped curve or possibly a, uh, a skewed or maybe even a bimodal curve in which you can, um, can study um, variants, but um, frequently, and, and a number of genome-wide association studies have done this, have, have looked at, say, um, the uh, upper 7.5% versus the lower 7.5% uh, looking for um, differences in uh, gene associations with um, these qualitative traits. Uh, and um, uh, in this instance, quantitative traits, I'm sorry, uh, and correlation heritability uh, would be uh, opportunities there. This is uh, Manning Feinlieb's uh, study of blood pressure again. Uh, despite systolic blood pressure having uh, had some tough sledding in the genome association world in terms of identifying um, polymorphisms related to it, there remains this correlation of blood pressure uh, suggesting uh, monozygous twins are, are much more strongly correlated in terms of their systolic blood pressure than either dizygous or siblings. 
and, um, and, and uh, parents and offspring correlations, and certainly more than uh, you would from spouses, which would be a suggestion of uh, environment. So um, certainly a way to uh, look at uh, um, um, the uh, uh, twin pairs from a quantitative trait basis. Uh, heritability um, has been mentioned. Again, that's uh, the variance in dizygous pairs minus the variance in monozygous pairs uh, divided by the variance in dizygous pairs in, a, in, uh, in twin studies. Uh, and it's the fraction of the total phen phenotypic variation of this quantitative trait that's caused by genes. Uh, it varies from uh, zero to one. And if it's greater than 0.7 or 0.8, would suggest that there's a strong influence of heritability. So as you read um, the uh, literature, um, you have an idea of kind of what this means. The, um, the limitations of twin studies, obviously, is that environmental exposures may not be identical even in monozygous twins. Um, or there can be a very um, highly uh, similar um, in exposures. And uh, maybe that can be almost as, as uh, confusing um, 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 as, a, as a reason for association. Uh, there can be some differences in gene expression. Um, there may be some heterogeneity um, of the genotype um, between twin pairs as uh, um, some, some suggestions from uh, why some of the twins have the, the differences they have. And then there's this concern about an ascertainment bias in which a co-twin with a disease is more likely to participate in a twin study than the co-twin um, um, who is unaffected. And um, so just a... Uh, uh, a concern that uh, you'd want to have good participation rates from uh, all the uh, twins asked to particip participate in a twin study. Uh, we now want to talk a little bit about linkage uh, analysis, and uh, this is, is the um, a family based approach to the identification of susceptibility genes, or at least the uh, starting to be able to locate them. Um, uh, on the um, on the chromosomes and um, and where they might be uh, in the um, in the gene in the genome, um, linkage is the tendency for alleles at one locus uh, loci that are close together to be transmitted together in an intact unit or a haplotype, uh, and this has to do with recombination. The further apart, as Terry mentioned, the further apart the genes are, the more likely over time is, is that there will be a recombinant event in which they will end up on, on different chromosomes. Uh, so we try to measure this, um, this frequency of recombination with a recombinant fraction. Uh, this varies from 0 to 0 0.5, with 0 being tightly linked, no recombination. These two genes are always found together. And 0 0.5 is they're unlinked uh, and, uh, and totally independently associated. And the distance between them is then given in centimorgans um, this is a, a map distance rather than a geographic or physical difference. It's the genetic length over which one recombinant uh, crossover will occur in 1% of meiosis. So it um, uh, gives a certain genetic length. And again, as Terry's mentioned, there are uh, recombinant hotspots, et cetera, that, um, uh, that would uh, obviously um, decrease that uh, uh, or, or look like it was uh, um, uh, even further apart. So as you go down generations, if each of these is a generation, obviously you have recombinant uh, events, uh, and so that the the um, the genes with very little um, recombination obviously end up as being very closely clustered together. Um, um, in which um, the linkage disequilibrium suggests that they're, they're uh, being passed on together and are physically uh, associated um, as one goes down through these, uh, these generations. So this whole idea of linkage dis uh, disequilibrium obviously is uh, take advantage of um, with the recombinant fraction. Um, obviously, the um, the extent of recombination obviously is a function of the number of generations and the recombinant fraction um, so that um, uh, ones that are, are uh, far apart and, and already not associated it will become completely disassociated uh, in complete equilibrium in very few generations, whereas 
are those with a, a very high uh, recombinant fraction, or a very low recombinant fraction, that is the theta being almost zero, um, may over many thousands of generations um, never really come into um, uh, even close to equilibrium of them basically disassociating. So um, uh, this is the background of, of, of linkage analysis. Uh, so in, in, uh, in looking at linkage in family studies, you would assume a mode of Mendelian inheritance, um, autosomal dominant, et cetera. Uh, you would identify markers with known positions to serve as the references, and then you would determine the number of, of first degree relatives who show recombination, assuming different values of theta. Uh, um, and then this Lodge ratio that uh, Terry had introduced, uh, it's the ratio of likelihood of observing the family data that you observed up here with the various values of theta to the likelihood of observing the family data if the, the loci were totally unlinked. So you take um, uh, the family data from up here, make certain assumptions about what the recombinant uh, fraction would be, uh, and then um, uh, assume it relative to uh, no uh, um, a, a theta of zero, that is um, um, a complete disassociation. So this, this um, uh, LOD score, uh, the logarithm of the odds, or Z, is the likelihood of the data if the loci are linked at a particular level of theta versus the likelihood of the data if they're unlinked. And um, so the best estimate of theta is the recombinant frequency between the marker locus and the disease locus, and the magnitude of Z really identifies which of those um, um, uh, likelihoods is the greatest. The LOD score of greater than three is essentially a thousand one odds that the loci are are linked at that level of uh, of theta, and um, and LOD scores can be added across families. So what um, what you're trying to do is essentially within these uh, correlation um, these linkage uh, blocks, a uh, lot blocks of linkage disequilibrium, uh, identify. Um, the likelihood is is that um, that uh, w your your gene markers be one of them over whatever um, are linked together. The likelihood of that occurring versus them perhaps being in another um, block of markers, uh, and that ratio of the odds uh, is the LOD score and gives you an idea of which ones were or were not linked. So I think the thing to remember in terms of um, reading about these is obviously a LOD score is, uh, of greater than three uh, would be what you would be, um, be interested in, in identifying as something that are physically linked um, uh, on the genome. Now, the, the first example I gave was uh, talking about trios. The, um, and this is a, a study design uh, which is a little different um, that we frequently used in epidemiology, uh, that's the affected offspring and both of their parents. And basically that's all, that's, the, that's what the trio is. There's not unaffected uh, offspring or, um, or other individuals. Um, and the, uh, the phenotypic assessment only is in the affected offspring. The, the genotyping is in both parents and the affected offspring. So, um, you spend your money on phenotyping the, the children of the parents, and you spend your money on the genotyping of all three, um, uh, so it's a relatively efficient in terms of uh, expenditure of phenotypic resources. Uh, these are used in both discovery and replication GYs, and you can come up with examples of both in which uh, a trio design was used, say, to um, identify um, from, say, 500,000 SNPs, uh, identify, say, a smaller number, 20,000 or so, that then could be put into a case control design. Um, probably more frequently would be your typical sequential design of, of, uh, of, of, of a GWAS study with, say, a half a million SNPs, uh, then uh, replicated with one or two case control studies with at one of those phases, a trio being involved, 
uh, because of some of the advantages that trios have, it's really a, a different, um, uh, it's kind of a different study design, but it's also not susceptible to population stratification, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, and this is, this, uh, this kind of confounding is due to the sampling of cases and controls of populations of different ancestries. Well, clearly, in a trio, you know who the ancestors are. You've got the two parents and you've got the, uh, the affected, and so this is, this does not, um, a problem in trios. And so as one component of a multi-stage um, genome-wide association study, um, this could have some advantages. The test that is done then uh, is test whether the, uh, any given allele at a, at a given locus uh, is transmitted to the affected offspring by parents more frequently than expected by chance. The chance would be 50%. So heterozygous parents would transmit the alleles at a given locus in equal frequency. So 50% um, uh, frequency of any given allele uh, being one of the two alleles of the child. And affected offspring should receive the disease-associated allele more frequently, and therefore there's no um, need for a control group. And this is called uh, the transmission disequilibrium test, TDT. So here's a uh, study of uh, type 1 diabetes um, with this particular uh, allele. And um, what you have are uh, um, a probands who are not affected with, with uh, diabetes. And those families which uh, have a proband, a child with affected diabetes, and um, in these, in these uh, children, there's um, uh, this many transmitted and this many not. This should be 50-50, and you can see it's almost 56% uh, in this non-affected uh, group. You can see it's basically one-to-one, 50-50. -one, uh, these are not significant from 50%. These are highly significant from 50%, suggesting that this particular allele is transmitted more frequently to in affected families. Um, uh, than by chance. Uh, so this TDT uh, is, uh, again, a little different study design than um, we have in, in other parts of epidemiology, but I think still quite an efficient um, and, um, and useful one. It gives you very similar data. Uh, this is uh, another uh, type 1 diabetes study um, from Hoconerson, um, and um, here is actually um, three uh, SNPs, um, again, uh, with the case control study uh, done as part of this, uh, here's the allele that uh, was looked at, and, um, and the minor allele frequency. So in this instance, what you have is your case control study, your minor allele frequency uh, here is greater than your controls, uh, gives you an odds ratio of 0.8 and a p-value. Um, in this instance, um, the controls have a higher um, mean a minor allele frequency than the, um, the cases, uh, and so that this um, allele is a protective allele, gives you an odds ratio of less than one, uh, et cetera. Um, and if you look at then within a, a subgroup of this study, a, a, a second phase of this study, again, you had um, still the comparison of the same allele with the, say, the wild type allele, the, the major allele, uh, and you can see the, uh, the transmission um, here, uh, rather than 50-50, uh, should be, um, was, um, was much uh, different than that here. It's the other way because it's protected, um, and so you can see in this particular study where they did both of these in different uh, subgroups, uh, a, a very similar kind of information from the case control study to the, um, to the TRIO study. So I think um, if I were to design perhaps the, uh, the ideal uh, genome-wide association study, it would be nice to have one of the replications perhaps as a TRIO because you'd obviate this risk of, uh, of, of um, uh, having um, population stratification. Now there are some limitations. Obviously, uh, one of them uh, is it's difficult to assemble TRIOs if there's a late onset of disease in the affected child. Obviously, you need the parents, uh, and so if you have a late onset of disease, you're going to have uh, some um, 
uh, difficulty assembling uh, the trios. Um, secondly, uh, and more subtly, they're sensitive to small degrees of phenotyping errors uh, in which the, the transmission of the proportions between parents and offsprings gets distorted. Uh, and there's actually one of the 109 uh, GYs that I've reviewed, um, this uh, study by Kirov with schizophrenia is, uh, is an example of that, uh, where um, it appeared that they actually uh, handled the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the genotyping different in the parents than in the proband, uh, and um, came up with all sorts of distortions, which is described in this, uh, this paper. Um, so um, there are some disadvantages of this. Uh, there are some other uh, issues to talk about with family-based designs. Um, um, there also have been uh, genome-wide associations in affected and unaffected siblings, and a kind of a, a TDT um, has been used um, to uh, analyze those. Uh, an area that I find very interesting is is this trying to account for the heritability um, uh, or gene genetic risk. In other words, if you have a positive family history uh, and you add the, the genes and the risk factors to it, can you account for it? This kind of gets to the question of when are we done? In other words, how many gene variants do you have to study before you say I've accounted for the genetic aggregation of this disease? So for example, this would look like say if your um, multi multiple logistic um, equation uh, had a term with positive family history, and say this gave a, um, uh, a likelihood um, um, ratio of, you know, a, a, you know say a, an estimate of relative risk of uh, two or three or something, what would happen if you added the, uh, the various uh, polymorphisms to that? And there have been uh, some uh, other studies have, uh, have done this and talk about the percent of familial risk which is accounted for by uh, these gene variants. Um, there also can be obviously the multiple adjustment of intermediary risk factors uh, to identify um, risk in first degree relatives. Uh, and this obviously has been a lot of discussion in the Framingham Risk Study in which um, their initial discussions um, showed a relatively little uh, predictive value of family history after adjustment for cholesterol and blood pressure, et cetera. Uh, this has reemerged with perhaps more precise risk factor data uh, from the multiple generations now uh, of the Framingham risk. Uh, and, um, and so I think this, is, um, this continues to be uh, an interesting uh, area. This is a study that um, um, I've been involved with for a while. This is the sibling study at, uh, um, with Diane and Lou Becker at uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, started enrolling uh, siblings, um, 30 to 59 year olds of, of patients, siblings of patients with coronary disease uh, with onset of less than 60 years and then following them forward for incident coronary events. Turns out that their, their uh, 10 year risk is, uh, is about 20% uh, uh, overall. Uh, so it's a relatively uh, high risk group just on the basis of them being brothers and sisters of early heart disease patients. Um, we also um, calculated the 10-year the risk from the Framingham uh, risk score uh, was calculated at baseline. Uh, and uh, these uh, individuals, um, particularly the men, had a 66% excess risk than would have been predicted uh, by the Framingham risk score at baseline. Women were closer, only about a 12% increased risk. But the suggestion is, is that, um, at least in this group, the Framingham risk score in, in um, siblings um, really uh, falls short, particularly in men. And there's some additional um, things there, uh, which I think we would um, uh, suggest would be genetic. So um, in conclusion, I think family-based studies have been the cornerstone of uh, of identification and quantification of familial risk and the heritability of human diseases, and again, uh, do uh, provide the rationale for getting into larger, more complex, more uh, expensive study designs. The linkage analysis identifies the location of genes uh, with known markers, and we're going to hear about the HAP map and, um, and other um, studies uh, um, uh, from Terry uh, next. Uh, 
and I did want to talk about this trios as a, a family-based design um, uh, uh, that's been used both for discovery or replications in GWAS and certainly in candidate gene studies. Um, but um, so uh, the, the family-based uh, designs, I think, will continue to be uh, useful. They've been, um, again, I think, incorporated with some of the genome-wide approaches. Um, but they still uh, form certainly a, an important part of, of the genetic epidemiology literature. Uh, questions? Bill. So am, am I correct if I, if I think of heritability as sort of roughly uh, attributable risk for all the genetic exposure? Is that a similar concept or not? Well, heritability is the percent of uh, variance explained. I think, I think um, it's kind of the discrete versus continuous uh, I think uh, I think they're kind of they're they're kind of apples and oranges, uh, um, but I, but I think the for me the um, uh, the heritability has to do with the quantitative traits and the extent to which the variability in those quantitative traits can be explained by heritability. Attributable risk is what proportion of those cases can be accounted for by that uh, that gene, and so it's. I think uh, just mathematically they're quite different uh, from the get-go. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, you know, if, if attributable risk is the proportion of disease, it can be explained. Really with heritability, you're looking at the proportion of variability in disease, whether they have disease or not, or the, you know, the proportion of variability in a trait. So while they're, they're somewhat related concepts, I think they're, they're not, they wouldn't map. Okay. Xiaobing Wang from Children Memorial Hospital. Um, I just wonder for twins, besides the utility for estimate heritability, what other utility could it be for genetic either association study or GWA studies? <clears throat> well, I, I think there are um, there are many, many um, uh, opportunities within twins to study a, a great uh, number of things. Um, obviously, the extent of concordance um, and um, and heritability um, is of interest. Um, of also interest within the monozygous twins is is um, some people call it discordance or lack of concordance, because then you can start looking at. Um, if the genome is essentially the same, uh, but if the phenotype has some differences to it, um, there's the other flip side of the coin um, in, in, in to look at what could, could have caused that. So in the same way that, um, that uh, you're interested in twins because their environment and their um, is very much the same, and then with dizygous twins versus monozygous twins, you can look at the difference in the genome. I think within monozygous twins, with difference in phenotypes, you can look at the extent to which um, there are a variety of um, not only environmental, but I think some other issues like epigenetic and other kind of post-genome um, uh, uh, things that have been been going on, um, and this could get into things like pharmacogenetics and the, and a whole variety of things that you know, because you've basically, um, you know, stratified by the genome, uh, so you have a, a complete culture. One other thing that you can you can look at is, is as Tom said, sort of post post genomic um, modifications. So epigenetic modifications occur 
by the environment. And there, there have been some nice studies, you know, showing that epigenetic changes in, in identical twins are very similar at young ages, very, very different in, you know, in, in their 50s or, or so. It's kind of a, the classic study. Um, also, a recent study of copy number variants that, that um, many copy number variants actually arise somatically, so sort of after, you know, embryogenesis and that, um, and, and showing differences between identical twins and the numbers of, of copy numbers and that association with, I think it was schizophrenia, with one of the, the psychiatric diseases.